We are a nation of peace. We like peace. But they didn't like us. We know that we as a society are better than this. We know that hatred will never win out. Here in Pittsburgh, um, hate will not triumph. Love will win out today. All of us have to take steps um, uh, to counter hate with love, to counter darkness with our light. Here we stand again. A mass shooting in America. Evil enters a place of worship. Sabbath will never be the same at the Tree of Life Synagogue in a quiet Pittsburgh neighborhood. 11 innocent people gunned down at a baby naming ceremony. Six police officers shot, others also recovering in hospital. The gunman hell bent on killing Jews, charged with 29 different counts, including hate crime. The Jewish community responding by declaring faith, hope, dignity, and respect in the face of hate. Today on Context, anti-Semitism on the rise in Canada and around the world. What is the way forward, Jewish perspective from Canada and across the ocean from Israel, as we grapple with yet another unspeakable gun tragedy motivated by racist hate? I'm Lorna Duick. I'm Sheldon Neal. And I'm Molly Thomas. And this is Context. Israel stands in solidarity with the victims of the Pittsburgh Synagogue. Context Jerusalem correspondent Marnie Blom tells us how that country is responding. Our community is um, devastated by the attack in Pittsburgh. The Jewish people have a long history of persecution. Avi Ben Lolo of the Simon Wiesenthal Center weighs in on the motivation of the murders and a way forward. It's been almost a year since a deranged gunman opened fire at a Texas church. Pastor Paul Buford is in Sutherland Springs with how his community is healing after that massacre. Rabbi Jordan Cohen is here to explain the far-reaching ramifications the Tree of Life synagogue tragedy has on his own congregation here in Canada. Many are asking, where does hatred for the Jewish people come from? Why, when there are more than 13 million Jews, are they the people that are targeted? We go now to the president of the Simon Wiesenthal Center for some answers and the way forward. Firstly, our community is um, devastated by the attack in Pittsburgh, and we mourn the loss of the 11 souls uh, that were tragically murdered. We're concerned about the rising tide of anti-Semitism, both here at home, across the United States, and in Europe as well, where we've seen a rising tide of nationalist groups, uh, white supremacist groups, Islamist groups, who are all uh, propagating anti-Semitism, uh, both online, in the media, and at rallies. And all of this put together, I believe, is what's causing the rising tide of anti-Semitism, which can and does, and as we saw in Pittsburgh, lead to violence. The fact that this attack took place during a worship service makes it even more heinous. A place of worship is a sacred place. It's a place of peace and a place of grace. It's a place where a community comes together to celebrate that that they hold most dear and most sacred. What makes this a hate crime is the fact that he was motivated by the hatred, not because he necessarily knew the people. It could have been any Jewish person. It could have been any synagogue around the world. This synagogue was vulnerable, and he chose to use that in a very cowardly act uh, to kill as many Jewish people as possible because they were Jewish. The Jewish community has a very long history of suffering uh, against anti-Semitism. We've witnessed, obviously, the greatest uh, tragedy of all, which was the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jewish uh, children, men, women, who were murdered because of this Nazi ideology, the white supremacist ideology, but it was based on anti-Semitic beliefs that spanned centuries and centuries. The Jewish people are, are very small in number. We only number about 13 million in the world. We're not that many. 
yet we are the most victimized group. When you look at all statistical records, we are still the most victimized group, and it's shocking that in 2018, this is still the case. We just ran a, a study this summer. We hired Nanos Research to go coast to coast and document anti-Semitism, and what they found was shocking. Approximately 15% of Canadians have anti-Semitic attitudes, and that's the low end. The high end, which is in Quebec, 27% of Quebecers hold anti-Semitic attitudes. That represents well over 5 million Canadians. We will be back and we will rebuild even stronger. Well, the way forward is, uh, is the way forward we, we've always gone. Firstly, the Jewish people are always hopeful. At the same time, I'm really proud of the fact that we have so many friends in the non-Jewish community um, who stand with us because I believe that that's the solution, that's the universal solution. You know, whereas in the Holocaust, there weren't enough people speaking out and standing up. Today, I could safely tell you that people from all faiths come to us and they want to work with us. They want to participate in this effort to rid society of anti-Semitism and hate and, dis and discrimination in general. And I think that that is the path forward. If we're all in this together, we can solve it together. The entire people of Israel grieve with the families of the dead. We stand together with the Jewish community of Pittsburgh. We stand together with the American people in the face of this horrendous anti-Semitic brutality. And we all pray for the speedy recovery of the wounded. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responding to the Pittsburgh Synagogue Massacre. Israel has come together to mourn the loss of their Jewish friends in the United States. Joining me now to discuss how the country is responding to the attack is our correspondent, Marnie Blum. Uh, she joins me now from Jerusalem. Uh, Marnie, can you give us a sense of the atmosphere in Israel after the tragic anti-Semitic synagogue killings in Pittsburgh? Well, directly following the attack, the sense here was shock, sadness, despair, and anxiety. As you probably know, many Israelis have family and friends living in the United States, and there was a sense of, is somebody that I know a victim or has become a victim? As we know, the names were not immediately released. And so, uh, yeah, there was a great sense of sadness here and also a frustration, because yet again, there's another anti-Semitic attack. And we just wonder, the people wonder here, if these types of attacks will ever come to an end or there will be solution found. And I'm curious, Marty, does the history of persecution and anti-Semitism in general of the Jewish community make these attacks all the more tragic? Well, you know, whenever there's loss of life, it's tragic. So I think one loss of life isn't more tragic than another. But... What is tragic is potentially the fallout, the blame game um, the, that uh, will be discussed now and in days to come. And what is tragic when the victims or family of the victims, because the Israelis feel very much a part of the family, the Jewish community family in the United States. And so when uh, the finger of blame gets pointed back at members of the family being Israel, being the prime minister of Israel, I mean, that is when it becomes tragic, but also the sense of, you know, when will this anti-Semitism ever stop? Will there ever be a solution? Uh, this is the largest attack against Jewish people in the United States. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League says anti-Semitic acts have risen sharply. Uh, why do you think this is? Well, I think there's actually probably two dimensions to the answer to that question. And the first is actually to answer the question you know, who are the instigators, who are the perpetrators, and why is their voice getting louder? Why are their actions getting more aggressive and more violent? You know, are they the jihadists associated groups? Are they, whether they're white uh, supremacists or black supremacists or neo-Nazis or anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-Zionist? You know, why are these groups becoming more powerful and louder and more aggressive? I mean, that's really the question that needs to be answered. And then I would say the second Second dimension is a spiritual dimension. You, I know, Sheldon, you are a student of the scriptures of the Bible, as am I. And when we read, you know, the Hebrew scriptures as well as the New Testament scriptures, we see something called birth pangs of Messiah. And I think basically we are living in the days, the forerunner days, the coming of Messiah. And according to scripture, we know that there are going to be troubled times. There's going to be increased lawlessness. And uh, so I think 
this also would be an answer in that it is a reflection of the times that we're living in, uh, the times on God's prophetic timetable, the days before the coming of Messiah. Important perspective, Marnie. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Good to join you today. That was Context Foreign correspondent Marnie Blum. She joined me from Jerusalem. Thank you, Sheldon and Marnie. A very valuable perspective from the Holy Land. Now, the attack on the synagogue in Pittsburgh reminds us how vulnerable we can be when we simply gather in a place of worship. Two years ago, we had a similar attack here in Canada at a Quebec mosque. Six innocent people were killed. I was in Quebec right after that attack, and now that province is seeing yet another attack, this time on religious symbols in the public square. The new Quebec Premier, Francois Legault, has vowed to ban certain public workers from wearing religious symbols. This would include teachers, police officers, and judges. Does this go against our right to religious freedom in Canada? Dr. Glenn Smith is the chief advocate for Christian direction. He's from Montreal, but is in Oxford, England today. Nice to see you, sir. Good. Nice to be with you. Glenn, should we be worried about our religious freedoms, not only in Quebec, but in, in wider Canada as well? Oh, most definitely. Uh, freedom of conscience and a religion goes to the very essence of what uh, a democracy is all about and what people of faith of any religious tradition hold very dearly. So, yeah, we need to be concerned, deeply concerned. So Quebec, I mean, I, I've lived there. I know the culture a little bit. I know they've had this debate around religious symbols before. What makes uh, this time different? Ten years ago, when the uh, the Bouchard-Taylor, which we affectionately call the Bouchard-Taylor uh, report here in Quebec, looked at the whole idea of the place of religion in the public sphere and how do you arrive at what the Supreme Court calls these reasonable accommodations. Going to the very heart of that was about religious symbols. And the Bouchard-Taylor Commission said, as you just said in the intro, that for justices, for police officers, for prison guards, that they should not be wearing ostentatious religious symbols because they're in a position of exercising power. Unfortunately, the Quebec government never implemented anything related to the Bouchard-Taylor report. And because I know Charles Taylor well, he told me the one place where we never got any traction on the report was in Quebec. What do you think about for the future then? Not only today, but, but you know, for, for the children to come and, and the way that they view religion in Quebec. Oh, I, th I think we're in for troubling times. I think it's going to be turbulent waters uh, for the next little bit because um, we're, we're not just in a period of what we call in Quebec laïcité or laïcisme, which unfortunately only gets translated into English as secularity. But, it's, but what are those accommodations that you have to make in the public sphere between religion um, and, and the state? Uh, and we haven't been able to find a rightful place for that. The, the, big, the big issue is the massive marginality of God and Jesus and religion and Bible and church and synagogue and mosque mm -hmm. uh, and pagoda in, in the public sphere. And because of the huge uh, reaction to institutional religion in Quebec, uh, everybody gets painted with the same brush. So I, I think it's going to be a time for people of reasonable faith uh, to join together in, in collective action uh, to say, hey, wait a minute, there is a place for faith in the public sphere, and it goes to the very heart of freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. Glenn, I appreciate uh, your thoughts today. Thank you for joining us. You're most welcome. That was Glenn Smith, Chief Advocate at Christian Direction. He is based in Montreal, but joins us today from Oxford, England. Still ahead, Pastor Paul Buford reflects on the horrific mass killing of 26 innocent lives in Texas. He leads a neighboring church in Sutherland Springs, Texas, and speaks about how his community is moving forward. And here in Canada, a rabbi explains how his community is reeling in the face of the worst assault against the Jewish people in American history. As the world watched the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting unfold, some Jews knew nothing about it. That's because it was Sabbath and devout Jews had their phones off when they turned them back on. After a day of rest and prayer, the world had changed. Rabbi Jordan Cohen uh, joins us now. And Rabbi Cohen, you, you actually, someone encouraged you to turn it on. Well, I decided to. I mean, we were gathered as we do every Shabbat, every Saturday morning, our kids, our families, our adults uh, for study and worship. and. Uh, and we gathered together at the end of the morning and it was then that somebody approached me around the afternoon to say, did you hear what happened in Pittsburgh? 
and all of a sudden you could see throughout the room, there's probably 100 people there, people reaching in and grabbing their phones that they probably hadn't touched since uh, 8.30 or 9 o'clock, checking their devices, and uh, you could just see a wave of shock going through the room. And then I didn't have mine with me, but I actually decided to go and get it and to check the news because uh, it was just you know, unimaginable and I wanted to learn more. You, this has hit close to home because you're a Canadian congregation in Hamilton. You've had multiple hate mails. Tell us about what you have experienced in Canada as a congregation. Well, it's not just, you know, in Canada and it's not just recently. I mean, anti-Semitism is a historic reality that the Jewish communities all over the world have had to deal with for thousands of years. Um, and it's on the increase now. I mean, uh, we were told uh, by Hamilton Police Services that uh, hate crimes in general are on increase and that the Jewish community is the most targeted. So we've received some really uh, vitriolic uh, hate mail. You've also applied for a federal grant, and I don't think Canadians realize this, that the hate is so marked that faith groups have a special grant program to pay for half of the security Correct. on our facilities. You've now had to use it twice. Twice. So we applied a number of years ago. It's called a SIP grant, Security Infrastructure Program, where the federal government will give matching funds for upgrades and security. So we've applied for it in the past to increase uh, cameras around the facility. And we just received a new one recently where we're putting bollards in the front of our building so that uh, vehicles cannot uh, come near the building. Tragic in my mind that we have to think about putting security around a place of faith. You have been all around the world as a rabbi. Indeed. You've served in Australia, you've served uh, in Israel, obviously. How do uh, Jews react differently to this kind of crisis? I think it depends on the community and their historic experiences. Certainly Europe and, and European influenced countries. So when I was in Australia, which very much follows a sort of British model, they are very hyper vigilant in their security and they have, even within the Jewish community itself, uh, community security groups where they provide their own sort of private security guards for institutions throughout the community. Uh, you know, we haven't had to be that way in, in Canada, and we've had a fair measure of comfort, you know, thank God. Um, but, you know, my fear is, is we're headed in that direction. Okay, and that's you're saying that as a Canadian who's had now two security grants, you've described what you're doing to increase because of the hate mails you've had. What do you think the answer for the heart is on this? That's exactly the question I struggle with. I mean, you know, the incredible tightrope that we're walking is uh, wanting to maintain a balance between making sure that our community is, is, is safe and secure, but also at the same time wanting to be very much a, a key value for our Jewish tradition is wanting to be a, a welcoming and open community. And so right now, you know, the door is locked throughout the week and we have cameras being monitored and people need to be buzzed when they're coming in throughout the week. We have two schools in our building. But the, the, the moment is in the past, on the Sabbath, the doors have been unlocked and we are having a meeting this evening and we have to reevaluate that, that uh, policy and uh, that's probably gonna change. We know that we as a society are better than this. We know that hatred will never win out that those that try to divide us because of the way that we pray or where our families are from around the world will lose. And in Pittsburgh. That was the mayor of Pittsburgh speaking there. Now many of us may assume that anti-Semitism is a problem for our neighbors to the south, but our next Canadian guest proved that is not the case. Merle Cates is the executive director of Stand With Us Canada. Daniel Korn is with B'nai B'rith Canada. Both groups exist to educate and eliminate hatred towards Jews here at home. Nice to see you both. Thank you. Thank you. Merle, let's start with you. I know your organization really targets university students through education. Do you find anti-Semitism is alive and well with, with that younger generation? Yes, unfortunately we, we do. We find it on campuses, we find it in high schools. Um, it, it's not that it's pervasive, we're fortunate in Canada, but there is an impression that uh, Israel is being misrepresented in a way that the Jews are being targeted in what we're calling a new anti-Semitism mm -hmm. that we see in Europe, the UK, and the US, and in Canada as well. So, Merle, you call it a new anti-Semitism. What exactly does that mean? Mm -hmm. 
It means that it's really a uh, hatred for Israel uh, that doesn't allow for any theories of coexistence or peace or tolerance, and it has morphed into uh, a hatred for Jews on the far left and the far right. Okay. And that's why we try to reach out to non-Jews to educate them. Danielle, I know your organization has been looking at trends of anti-Semitic behavior across the country. Give us an idea of, of how bad it is out there. Uh, well, it, it hasn't been great as of late. Uh, our organization puts out an annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents. It is the authoritative document on anti-Semitism in Canada used by police services, uh, government bodies, NGOs across the country. Uh, we've noted a five-year uptick in anti-Semitic incidents uh, over the past five years. And for the last two years, um, we've recorded the worst record of anti-Semitic incidents for the years 2016 and then for the year 2017 uh, since we've started compiling this audit in 1982. Hmm. Uh, most problematic would say for the year 2017, there was a 107% increase in terms of anti-Semitic vandalism. And the types of things we've seen, uh, you know, scare the members of our Jewish community to the core. You know, things like jury must perish and Heil Hitler and Jews did 9-11, uh, swastikas galore. These are the types of things we're seeing, as Marilyn mentioned, too, at, at high schools, at elementary schools, on university campuses, and a across the country. Happening in Canada, which is known for multiculturalism, openness, uh, and love. Uh, I always Oops. wonder how those incidents affect a Jewish person on a, a daily basis. So, Merle, give me an idea. As a Jewish woman walking around Canada, uh, I know you travel extensively as well, uh, do you feel, do you feel uh, ill will towards you? No, not necessarily. I feel perfectly safe, actually. I, and you're right, I do travel extensively. And I feel safe everywhere. I guess that's many trips to Israel that has made me uh, understand security. And I know that we do have security. Our problem is, as Daniel was saying, with the kind of rise in graffiti and ugliness and, and hatred we're seeing, even in Jewish elementary schools, we have to now have security at every place of worship, every Jewish school, every Jewish center. Uh, and that's something that worries me. It's something some of us call the Jewish tax. And um, as a very small minority, that's something that's really difficult to yeah. be able to manage. Yeah, we see that in the States. President Trump musing about arming uh, all types of religious institutions after something like this. Uh, Daniel, uh, we are a very diverse, multicultural country. How can people of, of different backgrounds, different faiths, help the Jewish community after something like this? Well, that's a great question. Uh, our organization actually has an eight-point plan to tackle anti-Semitism, and it's something we've been pushing um, across the country. Um, in Montreal, for example, they've created a hate crimes unit, which has been very effective in uh, identifying and targeting the purveyors of hatred, be them anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti uh, anti-Black, anti-gay, etc. Uh, most recently, there was a man in Montreal just last week by the name of Robert Gossel, and Merle, I'm sure you've heard all about this, where um, the hate crimes unit found out swiftly and quickly that he was promoting anti-Semitism and charged him immediately uh, with willful promotion of hatred. And now he's no longer able to promote any type of this uh, anti-Jewish uh, and anti-Semitic uh, tropes that we've been seeing. He's no longer able to promote these. Now, if we had a hate crimes unit in every major city across Canada, this would better enable our um, police services to identify anti-Semitism and and um, bring to justice the purveyors of said anti-Semitism before it could escalate. Merle, quickly. And that's just one of the eight points. Okay, Merle, quickly, what needs to change? I completely agree, but I also believe that we need to be able to support, one, our Jewish students, both in high school and on campuses, by providing them with the tools that they can have a conversation about being Jewish, about Israel, about supporting a Jewish homeland, and on campuses, because there has been such a drive to try to isolate and demonize Israel. And I know that that's had an effect on the rise in anti-Semitism. So we support them and we try to educate the 80% that really doesn't know anything about the Middle East. Um, we need all of it. All right. We'll leave it there, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks Thank for having you. Me.
Merle Cates with Stand With Us Canada, Daniel Corrin with Benet Brith, both from Toronto today. Coming up, Pastor Paul Buford reflects on the tragic shooting his community faced when a deranged shooter terrorized a neighboring church and killed 26 innocent lives nearly one year ago. It has been nearly one year since a gunman opened fire in the First Baptist Church, killing 26 people and wounding 20 more. Our Molly Thomas was on the ground the next day to report on this unspeakable tragedy. One of the people she met was Pastor Paul Buford, who rejoins us today. Uh, Pastor, we certainly wish we weren't talking with you again about similar tragedies like this, but here we are one year or nearly one year later after what the people in your community faced. How are the people of Sutherland Springs coping? Well, I think we're doing remarkably well here. Um, our community is a very close-knit community, and being a bunch of people of, of very strong faith, I think that's helped us to get through this uh, in, in, a, in a way that has been difficult for a lot of other places that might have had, had shootings like this. Gun violence has become such a reality for so many Americans. I'm personally wondering, is, is faith enough to bring hope and support among such reoccurring gun tragedies like this? Or is it something that's untangible, it's something that feels good, but is it enough to really, really hit the, the, the elements of people's hearts that are really hurting right now? Well, I think that it is. I mean, it is our faith that has sustained us through this. It's, it's our faith that in the immediate aftermath of this gave us the assurance of where our friends were. And, and I think that it's a, uh, it's a sad thing for people who don't have that faith to, to look to, to say, yeah, I know where my friends are. I know where my loved ones are. I know that uh, uh, what they're doing. And, and if you don't have that, well, it would certainly make it a lot more difficult to, to cope with something like this. But our faith is what held us together as a community, as as brothers and sisters in Christ, of us being a church just down the road from where they were. I mean, we, we picked up and did what we had to do to help our brothers and sisters and help this community. And uh, and it was all about our, our faith being there of saying, look, you know, I know what y'all are going through is really horrible and, and really trying and, and all of us agree with you and everything, but let's keep our eyes on on the author and finisher of our faith, who is Jesus Christ. And so I, I yeah, I definitely think that it is. Now, there's, there's so many things that go along with that to, to just say, well, you can't just be with faith alone. Well, no, but faith is what sustains us in this, that, that we know there's something after this life. And we know that uh, uh, the Bible tells us that we can have an assurance that we can be there in the afterlife with our Lord and Savior. So it's, yeah, it's what we need. Pastor, thank you so much for joining me. You gave us a lot to think about. Well, thank you for having us, and God bless you guys. Our thoughts and prayers are with you continuously. That was Paul Buford of the River Oaks Church in Texas. He joined me from Sutherland Springs. Such an emotional show today, Molly. We really try to unpack what does healing look like on the aftermath of such a massacre. Yeah, and it, you know, there's so much hate in the world, but there's also so much love, and we saw that from various faith communities yeah. uh, today. Uh, next week, we go to the Parliament of World Religions. We have faith leaders from across the globe gathering in Canada. Wow. We're going to bring you the latest on that. Thank you so much for watching and taking and spending your time with us. We take a moment now to honor the victims of the Tree of Life Synagogue. <laughs> 